All right, welcome to Anatomy and Physiology. Uh, we're dealing with the respiratory system today in this video, and more specifically, we're going to be dealing with transportation of the gases. So at this point, in our esteemed careers, learning careers, hopefully we have a pretty good idea. Take a nice deep breath in. Ventilation, take a nice deep breath out. Ventilation, we have inhalation and exhalation. And what we're doing there is we're creating airflow, changing the volume of our thoracic cavity, therefore changing the volume of our lungs. Therefore, since pressure is inversely related to volume, as you breathe in and the thoracic volume gets bigger, we decrease the pressures in our lungs and everything's moving from an area of high to low, so it's going to rush from the atmosphere where pressure is higher into our lungs, and the opposite happens when we breathe out. That was ventilation. And then you guys should have also watched, watched the video, right, that talked about the fact that when you breathe in, you're bringing all of this air into our alveoli, okay? And then from there, we're going to have gas exchange. So we say here in the atmosphere, we're going to go ahead and let me change my color scheme a little bit here. I always have to set things up a little bit beforehand to try to condense these videos a little bit. But here in the atmosphere, we have approximately 160 millimeters of mercury of partial pressure of O2. And once it mixes with carbon dioxide through the entire um, conduction system that travels down to the alveolus. It's going to be mixing with CO2 that whole time. It's going to be approximately 104 millimeters of mercury by the time it gets into our alveolus, our alveoli, plural. Now, poorly oxygenated blood returning to our lungs poorly tells us there's not a lot of oxygen, right? So what is the partial pressure of oxygen out here? The partial pressure of oxygen is approximately 40 millimeters of mercury. It can be a little bit less than 40 millimeters of mercury. It depends on cellular activity, cellular metabolism. But this stuff is moving towards the lungs, right? It's trying to return to the lungs. And where does everything want to go from an area of high to low? So it's going to be going from our alveolus into our pulmonary arteries, these pulmonary poorly oxygenated arteries returning to the lungs. And as it does, 104 moves to 40, therefore 40 is going to increase. And it's going to increase. And it's going to increase until it becomes saturated. And we'll talk about hemoglobin saturation in just a second. But the red blood cells inside of this blood pick up that oxygen. The hemoglobin binds up that oxygen and therefore starts to become saturated. And by the time it leaves the lungs, as it's returning through the pulmonary veins, back to the left side of the heart, and then out to our tissues, we're not drawing the heart in this. We really simplified this circuit. We're just saying oxygenated blood and poorly oxygenated blood over here. But by the time it becomes oxygenated, the partial pressure of oxygen out here should be approximately 100 millimeters of mercury. It could be a little bit higher, up to about 104 millimeters of mercury. Depends on our gradients and how long the uh, oxygen is held in our alveoli, therefore how much diffusion occurs. Nonetheless, what you see here now is that the partial pressure of oxygen in our bloodstream heading out to the tissues down below is about 100 millimeters of mercury. And this is fantastic because this is the oxygen that our tissues need to run cellular respiration. This is the oxygen that our tissues need to run cellular respiration. Remember, cellular respiration is gas exchange. So it's oxygen going into the cells and it's CO2 going out of the cells. But we can also think of cellular respiration in terms of aerobic oxidation, right? The metabolism. Because what is this oxygen being used for? It's making ATP. So, let's write out the equation for cellular respiration. I hope all of you guys have background on this, and if not, go look it up. And we'll learn a bit here. Okay, take a deep breath in. What do we breathe in? Oxygen. 
when you ingest food, you're trying to get nutrients out of the food, and one of the most important nutrients is C6H12O6, which is glucose. We throw some phosphate groups at this, ADP and inorganic phosphate, and all of that together now is going to start to go through a chemical reaction. And we're going to make sure we draw our arrows going in either direction because this is somewhat reversible. Doesn't matter. We don't care right now. Let's go ahead and make some ATP. Okay, so out of this, in our mitochondria, we make a ton of ATP. Awesome. Go back and learn this material if you don't already know it. But for the purpose of physiology, what we really need to know is that through this process, we make a lot of ATP, 32 to 36 ATP per each cycle, Krebs cycle stuff. What else do we make, though? What's the metabolic waste that comes out of this? The answer is carbon dioxide and water. So that's what's so important about understanding cellular respiration, the gas exchange, because as oxygen moves from our blood into our cells, and we'll see why in just a second, the cells make CO2. So as oxygen moves in, cellular respiration occurs, making CO2, and therefore the CO2 will end up moving out. We're just looking at it, and it doesn't really matter though, right? Simple cuboidal epithelial tissue here, some tissue in the body, doesn't matter. It's just easiest to draw simple cuboidal. So they take in the oxygen, they make the CO2. They take in the oxygen and they use the oxygen so what's going to be the partial pressure of oxygen inside of our cells all the time? If we're using oxygen all the time, then the partial pressure of oxygen inside the cells is always going to be low because it's using it. And that's the case. Down here inside of the cells, the partial pressure of oxygen is always less than 40 millimeters of mercury. It's always small. And if the metabolism, if the cellular metabolic rate increases, it uses more oxygen. That's why we have the less than symbol. And where does everything in the universe want to try to go from an area of high to low? So if we get 100 millimeters of mercury, partial pressure of oxygen, traveling down to our tissues, and the tissues have less than 40 millimeters of mercury, that's going to automatically create that concentration gradient required to move that oxygen down into the cells. Awesome. So now we got oxygen in the cells running our cellular respiration. The gradient gets even bigger as the cells use more oxygen, which now allows even more oxygen to enter the cells just by passive diffusion alone. And then those cells make carbon dioxide. So what is the concentration of carbon dioxide inside these cells going to look like? Is it going to be high or is it going to be low? Well, if the cells are making the carbon dioxide, then the carbon dioxide concentration or partial pressure of carbon dioxide in these cells is always going to be high. And in fact, it tends to range greater than 45 millimeters of mercury. This is the partial pressure of CO2. And why this is important is because now if we look at the arterial blood, the stuff that's bringing oxygen, oxygenated blood, out to the tissues, and we try to look at the partial pressure of carbon dioxide out here, it's going to be relatively low compared to the cells. Okay, This is going to be less than 40 millimeters of mercury. That's the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood that's going to the tissues. So, since everything wants to go from an area of high to low, 45 millimeters of mercury in the cells moves into the blood towards the 40 millimeters of mercury. And then mixes with that 40 millimeters of mercury. It's going to increase that 40 millimeters of mercury. So as blood leaves the tissues, we've removed the oxygen, so it's poorly oxygenated, and we've added CO2. So the partial pressure of CO2 out here, let me go ahead and write this in my light blue color. I like this color, actually just straight blue color. So the partial pressure of CO2 in the poorly oxygenated blood returning to the lungs 
partial pressure of CO2 is approximately 45 millimeters of mercury. All of this 45 moves into the blood, mixes with the 40, increasing the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and now that returns to our lungs. And if you recall, if you recall, the amount of carbon dioxide out here in the ear, air, maybe you don't know this already, but the partial pressure of carbon dioxide out here is very low. Okay? It tends to be something along the lines of 0 0.3 a little bit less than that, but we round up millimeters of mercury. Um, there's a difference there, right? In our lungs, it's going to be a little bit higher, but carbon dioxide is still going to move right into our lungs. It's going to move right into our lungs, going from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And I mentioned earlier that there is carbon dioxide that remains in our lungs all the time, right? And that's true. Take a deep breath in. We're breathing in oxygen. Take a deep breath out. We're breathing out CO2. But breathe in. Do we get all the oxygen from our tubes into our lungs? No. There's some trapped in the tubes. Breathe out. There's blowing that oxygen back out again, and we're now adding CO2 to the mix. But were we able to get all, rid of all that CO2? No, there's still CO2 left inside of that conduction system. Breathe back in. Where does that CO2 go? Right back into our lungs. So we're still going to have a relatively high partial pressure of CO2 inside of the alveoli. It's approximately 40 millimeters of mercury here. But that's okay because 45 right here, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 45 millimeters of mercury still goes towards 40. Just don't increase that too much more than that, right? And then we breathe out, and that 40 goes out into the air around us. And then gets recycled by the plants in the world around us, right? Which make oxygen and glucose for us to work through our cellular respiration. Symbiotic relationship. That's how oxygen is transported. Now couple things to think about. Oxygen is a very nonpolar molecule. Therefore, when it gets into our plasma, nonpolar. This is hydrophobic. This is terrified of water. So when oxygen gets into the bloodstream, well, the large majority of the bloodstream is plasma. The large majority of the bloodstream is water. So can oxygen just mix? Not very well. In fact, when oxygen diffuses into our bloodstream, only about 2% of it dissolves in the plasma. Only about 2% of it because it is so nonpolar. Therefore, what does the body have in order to move nonpolar molecules through the bloodstream? We have carrier protein. And what is the carrier protein for oxygen? It's hemoglobin. So all the rest of oxygen needs to bind to hemoglobin. 2% dissolves, the rest binds to hemoglobin. All that oxygenated blood that moves out to our tissues is oxygenated because the oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. In other words, hemoglobin starts to get saturated with oxygen as the oxygen binds to the iron in the middle of the hemoglobin. So that's why we need to go and look at a saturation curve. So everything over here that I prepped for you guys, this is called an oxygen saturation curve. And we want to look at how oxygen gets unloaded from hemoglobin. In order to do that, look at the x-axis, look at the y-axis, and you'll notice the x-axis is the partial pressure of oxygen in millimeters of mercury, and the y-axis is the percent saturation. So if we were 100% saturated, then 100% of hemoglobin would be bound up with oxygen. If we were 50% saturated, then 50% of the hemoglobin in your body would have oxygen bound to it. A couple things to note, 98% hemoglobin saturation 
we never make it to 100% saturation because 2% of the oxygen that gets into the plasma dissolves. Hemoglobin. And let's go ahead and add the word saturation here so that you guys can start to combine the thought process here of oxygen transport with the hemoglobin saturation curve. The red dots I put in indicate a normal oxygen unloading in the body, okay, in a normal scenario. <clears throat> and what I want you guys to look at here, I'm going to use a different color, on the uh, x-axis, this is the blood partial pressure in millimeters of mercury. So let's look at 100 millimeters of mercury, which is what we said oxygenated blood was. And if we take and say, all right, I want to try to determine the percent saturation at 100 millimeters of mercury, I would just make a dotted line up. Eh, I didn't do that very well. Let's try that again. <laughs> my line is hard to write straight. Whatever. You see that it hits my dots up above, but we want to be dealing with normal to understand this at first. So then where does this hit on the curve? on the saturation curve, so you'd follow, make a dashed line all the way across, and you'd see that at 100 millimeters of mercury, well, looks like we're at 98% saturation, which is exactly what we want. So get your, uh, your feet cemented in the ground, create that foundation of how to interpret this graph, and that helps a lot. Let's look at it at the cellular level. At the cellular level, we're at approximately 40 millimeters of mercury. So if you looked at this and said, okay, 40 millimeters of mercury, and you created your dot, dotted lines up. Sorry, I stepped in front of you there. I wanted to be able to see this better. And then dotted this across, you'd see you'd be at about 75% saturation. In other words, when oxygen gets dumped off at our tissues, we don't get rid of all the oxygen. And hopefully you've never thought that, right? Oxygen returning to the lungs is poorly oxygenated. It doesn't mean it's deoxygenated. The large majority of oxygen should still be there. And then as cellular activity increases, the partial pressure of oxygen decreases even more, so then we unload even more oxygen. But this uh, um, oxygen un unloading curve, this saturation curve, could also be used to understand patients in a medical situation. And there's something called a pulse oximeter that goes on the finger. Right? You've probably seen it before. It just snaps onto the finger and it actually has infrared lights and red lights that shoot through your finger through a point where you can actually have light go through. And then it monitors the ratio between the infrared and the red. I'm not going to get into too much, but it has to do whether it's oxygenated or poorly oxygenated. And using that pulse oximeter, we can measure the percent saturation in a patient very, very easily. Very easily. And it's not 100% accurate, but it's close enough. We can correlate it to what's really happening in the body relatively easily. And so let's say we put a pulse oximeter on a patient, and they're somewhere around here at 85%, where they should be at 98 to 100%. Well, when you see 85%, some of you might go, well, that's not a huge difference, Dr. H, but it really is. Because 85%, let's look at this, we'll make a dotted line over, and then we drop it down, and you can see that the blood is actually only about 50, 53, somewhat like that, millimeters of mercury, when it should be at 100 millimeters of mercury they're getting half that amount, which is hypoxia. This is hypoxia. This is low oxygen in the blood. So the percent saturation, although it looks high, has a huge impact on the body because at that point, the body's freaking out. We've got chemoreceptors that are monitoring any oxygen drops below 60 millimeters of mercury. And if it drops below 60 millimeters of mercury, you're going to see a patient under pretty severe respiratory distress something to think about. Now, the blue dots have to do with a disease state that causes oxygen to unload faster. And if oxygen unloads faster, we shift the curve to the right. This is a right shifted curve. And how you know this is a disease state? Well, 
is not normal. <laughs> actually, disease states can actually shift the curve to the left, so oxygen even has a harder time of unloading. But different factors can affect whether or not oxygen unloads. So say, for instance, if you're just in an environment with lower partial pressure of oxygen in the air around you, then you are going to be decreasing the millimeters of mercury that even enter your body to begin with. And if you do that, you're going to shift your curve to the right. So now, instead of at 90 millimeters of mercury, for instance, instead of being at 98% saturated, now you're more like 93% saturated, which makes sense because there's less oxygen in the air around you, so there's less oxygen to bind to your hemoglobin. So different things that can shift this to the right, different things that increase the unloading of oxygen. One thing is just a decrease in the partial pressure of oxygen getting into the blood for whatever reason. This could be pneumonia, right? This could be COB. This could be anything that decreases the amount of oxygen that gets into blood. So into, we can go ahead and say the arterial supplies because that's what we really are looking at here. Another thing that will increase the unloading is if there's an increase in the concentration of CO2, increases in the partial pressure of CO2 in the bloodstream, an increase in metabolic rate or simply being down at the tissue level, right? This is going to increase the unloading of oxygen, partially because CO2 competes for those oxygen binding sites. Three, something called the Bower's effect. Okay, this has to do with the amount of hydrogens in the system. So as we increase the acidity of the blood, then those acids start to denature the hemoglobin, and then hemoglobin can't bind the oxygens properly anymore, so the oxygens get dumped off. So the more hydrogens in the system, whether we have a patient with diabetes and ketoacidosis, whether we're exercising and we have lactic acid buildup, um, whether we have too many fatty acids, and then the most important acid, in my mind, as a human body, is carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is actually produced simply by taking carbon dioxide down here and we add it to water. So when we take these two things together and we mix them together, that actually produces something. Okay, that's going to make it go through a chemical formula and we just add all these numbers together and we're going to end up with h 2 CO3. I said numbers, but numbers and letters. So there's two hydrogens, one carbon, three oxygens. This makes H2CO3, and this is carbonic acid. This is an acid, and all acids can release a hydrogen into solution. So this releases a hydrogen into solution. So simply by having more carbon dioxide in our blood, we make more carbonic acid, which releases more hydrogens. And that scenario alone can start to cause oxygens to unload from our hemoglobin. Now, try to put this in a real world perspective. Easiest way to think about this is hold your breath. If you hold your breath, the amount of oxygen getting in the bloodstream is dropping. Oxygen unloading is immediately starting to, to uh, increase because of that. So we're getting less oxygen loading. Not to mention, now when you hold your breath, we're not getting rid of CO2. So the CO2 starts to build up in your bloodstream. We start making more and more carbonic acid. It releases more and more hydrogens into the blood. And now we start to denature our hemoglobin. Plus, hydrogens also have a binding site on hemoglobin, by the way which of course what allows for the denaturation. So they compete for oxygen binding sites there alone. A couple other things can affect this. Temperature. Okay, an increase in temperature to be more specific. Let me erase that. Right, if we increase temperatures, well, when you cook food, you denature food by increasing the heat 
right? You're denaturing, denaturing the molecules by increasing the heat in the environment. So now, for instance, you have a patient with a fever. Part of what's going on in that fever is it's denaturing proteins in the body. And hemoglobin is one of the most important proteins. I should never say that. There's so many important proteins. But hemoglobin is one of the important proteins. And therefore, the hemoglobin starts to denature and less oxygen can bind and it drops off. Fevers are nasty. Um, there's one more that has to do with uh, glycolysis. Um, not all of you have studied glycolysis at this point. 2DP, that's not a P. DP, no, no. Even professors can make mistakes sometimes. It happens. It's just slipping my mind because I don't think about, oh, I did have it right. It is 2-DPG. Oi, oi, oi. Dr. H. It's all right. It's all right. Making mistakes is learning, right? So, 2-3. I didn't even write the 3 in there. I think I said it out loud, but I didn't say it. But I didn't say it, but I didn't write it. For those that actually had me in class, you know that this is pretty typical for me. We're having some fun now. Okay, 2,3-DPG is another metabolic waste product, but it's from glycolysis. So when a cell is not uh, making ATP through the process of normal cellular respiration, right? It's not going through aerobic respiration. It's going through anaerobic at this point. And this is going to be a byproduct of that. And it also competes for the binding site for oxygen. All of these factors can decrease the loading or increase the unloading of O2. Whew, so much going on here. The video is already longer than I wanted it to be, but this is a really important subject matter to be thinking about, especially in the current state of the world with COVID, because it's all about our lungs and how much oxygen we get into them and how that oxygen gets transported through the body. But, in my personal opinion, and I've been teaching this for years in my classroom, my personal opinion, yes, oxygen is important, it helps us make ATP, but our body has more receptors. It is trying to monitor CO2 to a greater degree than it's monitoring oxygen. Small changes in CO2 cause your body to freak out, whereas small changes in oxygen, not quite as impactful in terms of brain activity. Carbon dioxide transportation is just as important as oxygen, if not more important than oxygen. And the reason why is because CO2 plus water makes acid. And your body hates acid. Acids are extremely damaging and extremely dangerous. So we need to think about how our body gets rid of this CO2. We can't just dissolve CO2 into water and be like, we're good, <laughs> because as it dissolves into water, we make acid, so we ain't good. So how does this work? Okay, we're going to come over to this portion of the board, everything CO2 transportation is down here. And we're going to say that the cells are producing CO2. We're just going to use our simple cuboidal cells up here, and it's going to diffuse that CO2 into the bloodstream. Okay? Now, everything's going from an area of high to low. And what if I told you that inside of our erythrocytes, inside of our red blood cells, we have a lot of a particular enzyme called carbonic anhydrins. It's an ASE, it's an enzyme. And here's what carbonic anhydrase does. Carbonic anhydrase is the enzyme that catalyzes this particular chemical reaction that makes carbonic acid. The more carbonic acid there is, sorry, the more carbonic anhydrase there is, the more carbonic acid will be produced. And so inside of our red blood cells, we actually have a very high concentration of carbonic anhydrase. Therefore, it constantly taking carbon dioxide and converting it to something that's not carbon dioxide. 
So what do you guys know about the concentration of carbon dioxide or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide inside of the erythrocytes? Is it going to be high or is it going to be low? Well, if carbon dioxide is constantly getting converted to something else, then there's not very much carbon dioxide here, which is great because that creates a concentration gradient, which now allows that CO2 to diffuse into the erythrocytes because there's less carbon dioxide in here, so it's going from an area of high to low. And it enters the red blood cell, and guess what? It comes across carbonic anhydrase, and it's going to get converted. But the first thing that happens as carbon dioxide enters the bloodstream, the first thing that happens is that just like oxygen, a little bit of it dissolves. And in this case, it's 7% that dissolves. 7% that's going to dissolve. And why is it not 2%? The answer is, is because carbon dioxide is slightly less Pol uh, uh, non-polar. It's slightly less non-polar compared to oxygen. It's got that carbon group in there. Okay, it starts to dissolve. It dissolves in the plasma. Okay. Now, what else happens? As carbon dioxide enters the erythrocyte, the second thing that happens is that approximately 23% of that carbon dioxide immediately binds to hemoglobin. Because hemoglobin has high affinity for a lot of molecules. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, hydrogens, lots of molecules combine to hemoglobin. So 7% of the total partial pressure of carbon dioxide dissolves, 23% of it immediately binds to hemoglobin, but that doesn't account for 100%, does it? So what happens to the rest? The rest is going to be converted by carbonic anhydrase. The other 70% gets converted. Okay. How does it get converted? It's going to be, I'm going to write this kind of small, hopefully you guys can see this, but it's going to be CO2 plus water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase. That makes carbonic acid. The carbonic acid immediately releases a hydrogen. And that hydrogen is going to go bind to hemoglobin, most of it. There's more to it, but we're trying to simplify things. Because red blood cells are buffers, erythrocytes are buffers, and the hemoglobin tries to grab onto those hydrogens. As long as the hydrogen concentration is low enough, all it does is buffer it and doesn't denature it. But what else is left over? If we get rid of a hydrogen, we still have hydrogen, one hydrogen, okay, left in this, in this molecule, we still have the CO3 group as well. Let's make this cell a little bit bigger so I have a little bit more room to draw. Let's make them misshaped so I have a little bit more room to draw. So what's left over? We got rid of one hydrogen, now we have HCO3. We got rid of a positive charge, so now we have a negative charge. So what else do we make? We make this molecule, which is called bicarbonate. So really, even though 70% of it gets converted to carbonic acid, what's going to happen immediately is because the hydrogen is ionically bound to the bicarb, the hydrogen dissociates, binds the hemoglobin, and what we're left with is bicarbonate. And that is awesome because bicarbonate is a weak base buffer and it's going to help our body. It's actually the number one buffer in your body. You'll love it, you'll love it, you'll love it. But at this point, the bicarb is still inside of the erythrocytes. So this bicarb needs to get out. It wants to get out. And how does it do that? It does that via a transporter that is going to move the bicarb out in exchange for chloride. It moves the bicarb out in exchange for chloride. This is an anti-porter. It moves two molecules in opposite directions. And it runs on the concentration gradients of these things. Okay? This is called a chloride shift. There's a big, long uh, medical name. If you guys need to go learn it, go ahead and do that. For my students, you guys need to know this is chloride shift. 
This guy is going to be a really important transporter for the digestive system, the urinary system. It's always moving bicarb around in your body. And that's important because bicarb is a buffer against acids. So, no. so let's walk through that one more time because I know it's complex. As carbon dioxide enters the blood, 7% immediately dissolves. The rest is going to enter the erythrocytes. 23% immediately binds to hemoglobin. That leaves 70% left over that's now going through a chemical reaction. In the presence of carbonic anhydrase, the carbon dioxide plus water gets converted into carbonic acid. That carbonic acid dissociates to make hydrogen. The hydrogen goes and binds to hemoglobin as well. And what we're left with is bicarbonate. And the bicarbonate gets transported out of the cell in exchange for chloride by chloride shift. In other words, 70% of it gets transported as bicarb. All of this is out in the systemic circuit. And this bicarb in the red blood cell that is poorly oxygenated but has carbon dioxide bound to it, okay, that now gets transported back to the lungs because bicarb is just out in the bloodstream, so it's just going through regular transportation. Bicarb is charged, so it can dissolve easily in the plasma. But once we get back to the pulmonary circuit, now we're going to be on this side of the board. Okay, this is the pulmonary circuit over here. And what happens here, and why this transporter called chloride shift is called chloride shift, is because at this point here, the chloride shift shifts. It flips. Okay, it gets into the pulmonary circuit. It receives a local signal from the lungs. My students don't need to know that. If you do, go ahead and go look it up. But if I have a transporter that flips, that means now it's going to be moving things in the opposite direction than it was before. So before it was moving bicarb out, now it's moving bicarb back in. So this takes the HCO3 minus, and it's going to start to exchange it for the chloride. The chloride gets moved back out. The bicarb now gets moved in. And as chemical reactions in the human body rely on the concentrations of their substrates, as bicarb levels increase inside the cell, now there's more bicarb than there is carbon dioxide, this is going to start to run everything backwards. So now the bicarb is going to grab onto the hydrogens that were bound to the hemoglobin. And as I do that, it reassociates to become H2CO3. It now becomes carbonic acid again. And what do we know about the inside of our red blood cells, they have a lot of carbonic anhydrase. And since chemical reactions are reversible, as long as the substrate is greater than the sum of everything else, my power button just came on, okay, therefore as the carbonic acid levels start to increase, 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 this is going to make the chemical reaction go from this side to the other side. So now we start making more CO2, and we make more water. That's not how water goes. And now, since carbon dioxide levels are high, because we're making more carbon dioxide, that carbon dioxide diffuses out of the erythrocyte and out into the alveolus. And that's how we get rid of the CO2. The large majority of CO2 in your body it has to get converted into something that's not CO2, transported through the blood, and then converted something back into carbon dioxide so it can diffuse and get transported out through exhalation. Hopefully that was enlightening. Hopefully that was uh, something that helps you study. There's a lot that goes on with oxygen transport. And if we start messing with any portion of this system, we start to affect how much CO2 is 
still in our blood, therefore we start to affect how much acid is in our blood. Okay, say for instance a patient that has COPD or asthma or COVID, and we start damaging the lungs. Well, that doesn't just mean that oxygen levels decrease in our bloodstream, it also means that CO2 levels are increasing. And as CO2 levels increase, then the amount of acid in our blood starts to increase. And this is really what starts to cause all the secondary diseases. As the acid starts breaking down the other tissues in our organs because it denatures the proteins of the systems, now we start getting a lot of other secondary organ failure due to the acidosis, due to the acid that's in the blood. All right, anatomy and physiology, not always easy. But once you get it, it's really, really fun. So fight through the difficultness of something, and you can do this. All right. Um, that's it for oxygen transportation and CO2 transportation. Hopefully this video helped you. Um, humankind, be bold. Hopefully see you in the next video.